Morning, everybody. I just realized I need to silent my cell phone, and since I realized that myself, I figure I can suggest everybody else do that too. So, welcome to um, those of you who are not um, faculty or students at, or staff at the University of Texas Dallas. Welcome to the University of Texas Dallas. Um, for those of you who are, welcome to our event today with the Center for Children and Families. I'm Steve Small. I am the now six month in office dean of the School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences. Um, which is the school that houses the Center for Children and Families, and we're extremely proud um, that um, we do so. Um, uh, we, uh, the School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences has three fundamental disciplines that we study within the school. We study psychology, we study neurobiology, and we study speech, language, and hearing sciences. And, um, in addition to those three academic areas where all of our bachelor's, master's, and PhD programs live. Um, we also have uh, six centers in the school, um, including centers for neurobiology, brain health, and aging. Uh, but this today's event is the Center for Children and Families, which is built upon our extraordinary child development group and our, our child language group. Um, and uh, um, you, many of you know the Center for Children and Families. Uh, uh, and, and come to some of these events on a regular basis. But I wanna tell you that um, the services that are provided by the Center for Children and Families throughout the community, uh, particularly uh, Wego Comigo um, and, and other uh, screening, uh, uh, completely uh, gratis um, screening procedures, trying to get children throughout our community ready for school, ready for learning, ready for language development, ready for reading getting these children from throughout our community, the Dallas community, ready to learn and ready to be, to, to be participants in the educational system is, is fabulous. We do work, uh, that we, um, uh, Dr. Owen and her team <laughs> do work uh, throughout the, uh, the school systems, the Dallas ISD, the Plato ISD. I, I know this from citing the memos of understanding that we make with all these places, and the amount of work that done is incredible. Um, the other aspects of, of our school are education and research, and the Center for Children and Families is heavily involved in education of our undergraduate students particularly, and some PhD, uh, some PhD students have done their work through the Center for Children and Families as well. And in terms of research, we're trying to understand at a basic level how children learn, how to help them learn better. So um, with that in mind, oh, I, I should mention today's speaker. Um, uh, um, um, Dr. Owen will introduce our speaker, but uh, Dr. Kathy hirsch uh, an extraordinary scientist from Temple University, um, is here today. Um, she actually talked at the first CCF forum 10 years ago. I'm stealing some of the thunder of her introducer, I think. Uh, but um, I, I, I know Kathy just a little bit, but I know from by reputation, she trained a, in a University of Pennsylvania Department of Psychology that over a 10 year period trained some of the, including herself, some of the absolute best um, developmental psychologists and, and cognitive psychologists in the world, including some of my good friends, Jay McClellan, Heidi Feldman, Alyssa Newport, Susan Golden Meadow, um, and, and others, all within a very short period of time, um, and Kathy, followed um, uh, their footsteps and, and trained in the, in, the same, in the same program and has become uh, world renowned um, in, in her field. So with that, I think, um, Margaret, are you? You're ready. So uh, with that, I introduce uh, Dr. Margaret Owen, the direct, uh, full, full professor of psychology uh, in the school and director and, and uh, founder? Director, co-founder co-founder and director of the Center for Children and Families. So, welcome, Margaret. I wanna extend my welcome as well, and I'm so glad to see all of you here for the 10th Annual Forum of the Center for Children and Families. And welcome to the Davidson Gundy Alumni Center on our campus. We started out with our early forums on campus, uh, many of them, and if you came to the early forum, to the first forum that Kathy hirsch Pasick graced us at, uh, you plunged through, uh, it was then cold, and we said we'd never do another forum in January. Oh my goodness. But we had a lot of mud that we went through to get to wherever we were meeting, so we welcome you back. 
with a campus that's now very beautiful and I'm very happy to see all of you here. Um, We've now entered our second de decade, obviously, the Center for Children and Families, and our annual forum really does exemplify the Center's mission to serve as a trusted resource for children and families through research, practice, and outreach. Um, we're small but mighty, I like to say, and we extend our services to the community thanks to the training and the help and the support of many students who we work with here, who get firsthand experience in the community in our community-based service learning course and work in our programs. Thank goodness, we're a small staff, but we can do so much with the wonderful students here. Putting research into practice is what the work of the center and today is all about improving the health and well-being of children and their families. So thank you very much for coming here and working with us together in this forum today. And so it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Kathy Hirsch-Pasek, our keynote speaker. And I couldn't be more pleased that she's here and back with us. Um, you've got bios at your table on uh, the various speakers that we have today. You've got a bio on Kathy. I still can't resist saying a thing or two. Um, when she was here 10 years ago, the theme of the conference, which is still very much what Kathy's all about, was the arts and sciences of play. So she talked about Oh, it was just so, it was so exciting, um, you know, about a mandate for playful learning in preschool to groom intelligent, socially skilled, and creative thinkers. And that'll be woven in today, you can bet. Um, she was very well known to me 10 years ago because Kathy and I, uh, someone at dinner last night said, how in the world did you get to know each other? We're from different corners of developmental psychology. But Kathy and I served together as investigators on the, I guess we'll say multidisciplinary team of investigators studying the effects of early child care in a massive study that spanned, well, it's now still going, but when we were together 15 years, and we came to know and love one another. I wasn't gonna say this, we also, in like second year in the study, we were both pregnant with our third kid, so, you know, that was another, source of bonding, we bonded over that one, yes. Um, so she was an ideal choice this year uh, to celebrate our 10th anniversary, and you'll hear why in a minute. Kathy's work has been sharply focused on how we can apply developmental research, and so there's no one I know of who can do a better job of generating and implementing science-based approaches to helping children grow and thrive. I won't name all of the various honors. She doesn't want me to. She said I shouldn't say a thing, but they're printed in your program, so I won't go through that. Um, but since its inception, it's been a goal of the Center for Children and Families to highlight and disseminate research findings that can make a difference in the lives of children and families. And this mission very much mirrors Dr. hirsch Pasek's entire career through which she continuously contributes to making children brilliant. You may hear that word too. So her research has direct and clear applications to all of us here today, the wonderful mix of us all. So today's forum focus on building a communication foundation for lifelong literacy has important implications for at-risk children in our community. In Dallas County, nearly 17,000 children are not ready for school, and that's just Dallas County, not ready for school when they begin kindergarten. And that puts them on a very difficult path starting at age five, and that path started years before that. Clearly, there's a need in our community to find ways to improve upon the development of strong foundations for children's successful language and literacy development to help set them up for success. So it's our goal today to grow in our understanding and stimulate new initiatives to do this. A long time, well, for a long time, I've been enriched by our keynote speaker's enthusiastic drive and innovative ideas for 
yet another new study <laughs> and a new inspiration. We were talking last night. I'm so glad to have her here with us this morning. So please help me welcome Dr. Kathy Hirschpasek. She's very worried about me, can you tell, guys? <laughs> okay, is this mic working? First of all, I want to tell you how happy I am to be in Dallas for a whole lot of reasons. Stephen, how cool is it that you're the dean? That's amazing. Um, and, and it's like amazing for all of you that he's here in Dallas because you're dealing with somebody who's so noted who took this role. So I'll say thank you for the field. And everyone here can say thank you locally. Margaret, look what you built. <laughs> I mean, this is the house that Margaret built. And I am just so darn proud of Margaret for all that she's done to make this such a successful program and to help the children of Dallas and the Texas community. That's kind of a big deal. Uh, Margaret doesn't just say it, she kind of does it. And then, I mean, how amazing is it to be with not only friends, but former students who are now good friends who I learned from, Mandy. How much have you taught me over the years that I just didn't know about um, when it came to how the brain functions, or Raul, who taught me all about bilingualism. I mean, being here is really another chance to learn from you guys, and that is the greatest honor that any teacher can ever have. Um, and of course, being back with good friends on the faculty Hi, guys. So it's, it's really cool to be here. Now, the other thing I'm really happy about is that you would let an Eagles fan into Dallas, which is really, really nice. So um, I want to I wanna thank you for that as well. Um, can't change that allegiance, but, you know, it gets more people to the games, I guess, because we all have those allegiances. Anyway, uh, today what I want to talk to you about is what we're going to call a communication foundation building blocks for lifelong literacy. And what I'm gonna suggest to you is that a lot of our attention has been rather misfocused. It's been misfocused on the literacy part and not enough on the language part. And I'm gonna show you why, and I'm gonna give you hopefully six simple steps that you can use, my colleagues, please don't shoot me for reducing everything you've done to six steps. Six simple steps that you can all do to really help change the situation and help every child be prepared with strong language skills and strong literacy skills. Now, you all know the data. The National Assessment of Educational Progress reports that more than 80% of third graders from under-resourced families are not reading at third grade in third grade. Now, you've probably heard, and I meant to look up whether Texas is one of those states, but there are a number of states that have decided that if you don't read at third grade in third grade, then you won't get to fourth grade. When I was speaking in Arizona, they had images of a whole lot of schools filled with third graders <laughs> because they have a lot of second language learners. And in that case, a lot of the reading isn't going at the same rate. And you don't just want to hold people back. Maybe what we want to do is help people get the language skills they need to survive in reading. Now there is an idea. And that language skill, Raul helped to teach me, needs to be in any language. So let me start right now by saying having two languages is a good thing, not a bad thing. In fact, having three languages is a good thing, not a bad thing. Only in America could it be a bad thing. Now, in fact, on October 30th, some of you probably saw that the new national report card came out. Was This was the headline that was reported in the New York Times two days ago. Reading scores on national exam decline in half the states. Yeah, what's going on here? And then I heard last night over dinner that for Texas, this is really, 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 really bad. Because you know those half states that kind of declined? Texas kind of declined more. <laughs> 
So it's something we really have to worry about. Now, Scarborough helps to explain what might be going on here. She suggests that when we think about reading, we have to look at the many strands that come together like in a rope to help explain how reading takes place. In her terms, most of our curricular activities in our schools and our preschools and what we tend to do is not play but to take third grade and move it to first grade and first grade and then push it down. So now we know that kindergarten is, as our colleagues say, the new first grade. In fact, three-year-old is going to be the new kindergarten, so keep pushing down. No, stop this nonsense. It's not good for kids, as we all know. And most people are focusing on the code skills only and on vocabulary drill. And if you want to know how successful that is, I have great news for all of you. In about five minutes, I'm going to give you the verbal SAT test. Surely you will remember all of the words that you studied before you took it the first time. Remember syzygy and ubiquitous? Okay, moving right along. The truth is that these interventions are not working. A systematic review by Barbara Wasik, who studies these things in language and literacy, was a review of 31 well-cited interventions. And it revealed, are you ready for the whopper, folks? It revealed that generally, in all of the studies we do that are successful, we get a 25% move in the needle or less. And I want you to think about that. We may have significant results statistically, but are we really making a difference for kids if we're teaching 25 words and, oh my god, they learned four of them? Are you impressed? Another meta-analysis examining curriculum interventions produced a small and non-significant effect size of 0.07, like you can't even imagine what a 0.07 is, right? You can't find it. Let's talk about moving the needle again. Did you see that? <laughs> it hardly moved at all. And those programs that have targeted specific vocabulary lists generally find that the kids may learn the list, but they can't use it tomorrow because you changed the context on them. Is that what you call learning? And in fact, they forget it in two weeks. So it's not sticky learning. And if you don't have sticky learning and generalizable learning, you probably don't have learning. You have what a parrot can do, not what a child should be doing. So maybe we need to spend more time supporting broader language skills, vocabulary, grammar, verbal reasoning. And I want to show you that this is not an outrageous idea. Because the scientific data show us that there are both direct relations, think of that a road that goes straight from language to reading, and indirect relations, that road then takes you through the code skills of phonological awareness and up to reading, and they both are very important for what our later literacy scores are going to be. In fact, in a secondary data analysis of the NICHD study of early child care and youth development. I always love that we lengthened the name. It made it quite a mouthful, Margaret, don't you think? Um, Amy Pace and I did a review with Peg Birch and all, and we found out that language, language scores at school entry is the single best predictor of later school outcomes in reading, in math, in social skills, and that goes to grade one and to grade three and to the curves that link grade one to grade three. That's amazing. So it's in the slopes, not just 
in the means. Now here's my picture of a brain because I know I'm supposed to stick one in every talk now. So Mandy, this is for you. I, I stole this from Stan DeHaan. I didn't actually steal it. He was kind enough to give it to me. But it really does tell the story. And to me, Stan DeHaan is one of the greatest developmental neuroscientists who are out there. And he's done a pretty good job of mapping the brain and what he, sh uh, mapping the brain for reading. He did it for math as well. And what he has shown us is that reading is kind of an invented cultural thing, okay? That links up the visual spatial, think of that as what your eyes see, okay? With the language that you're getting that is an evolutionary given. And what we get when these guys meet is what he calls the visual word form area. And because of the visual word form area, we are able to complete this cultural invention called reading. So everybody got the way it works? What that means is if you don't have the strong language skills to hook up with the visual skills, that you're not gonna get what you want in the visual word form. Makes sense, right? You're missing a whole part of the puzzle. Further, mountains of behavioral data tell us that the language skills of children in under-resourced environments are not at the level of those in more privileged environments. Yes, I know that this was challenged recently. I do get it by Sperry and Sperry. But I have to tell you that all of us who have looked at that data do not believe that there was any challenge, nor was there any replication. So a group of us from the language world, me, Erica Hoff, uh, Kathy Tamas lamanda Roberta Golinkoff, decided to do a team sport here and say, don't even think that this has been challenged. It has not been challenged. Okay, I'll put that to bed now, all right? And meaningful differences, well, it might not have been the best study in the world, the basic outcome stands. All right, in the classic Hart and Risley, most of you probably know this, it's, you know, finding number 24. But what it is that they, they tried to impute how many words past the ears of young children up until the age of three. And when they did that and looked at the number of words per hour in what they called, I hate these terms too, guys, okay, bear with me, their welfare group, right, you're dying, right? Their working class group, oh, you're dying more. And their professional group, okay, but that's what they called them. So that's what I'm telling you for right now. What they found was this huge difference where the kids who were in what they called their welfare group heard about 616 words per hour. Working class, 1,251. Professional, 2,153. That is humongously different, more than three times different, what passes your ears. And that's going to have consequences for the amount of language and the quality of language that you're going to get. And when we later look at what those impacts were, we find that it impacts vocabulary at age three. It also impacts how many of the root words you have that help you build vocabulary. A difference of 6,000 root words versus 4,000. So what do I mean by that? The teach in teacher, the heal in health. Finding those root words are the building blocks of building up more complex vocabularies. So today, I want to change the discussion of how to help early literacy and to suggest that we need to do more to create high-quality language environments for all children so that we build the foundation for them to be able to get good language and good literacy skills. And I'm gonna to suggest to you six, only six, evidence-based principles of language learning that will support reading 
And then I want to talk to you about implications and outreach. So let's go to the six base principles. You know, academics write papers. That's kind of what we do. That's our currency. And a lot of times I get, are any of you here not academics? Raise your hand if you're not an academic. OK. So those of you who aren't academics, that is, working in a university environment right now, for those of you wondering what I meant by that, don't you just love reading academic papers? <laughs> for those of you who are academics, don't you just love reading the jargonized academic papers that we give to our students? I mean, they're quite difficult. And for those of you who don't live in our world, you're going like, why should I go to paragraph two? OK, can't I just read the abstract and get out of here? So what we decided to do, we being Roberta Galenkoff and I, we decided to summarize what some of the main points were. What have we learned about language learning? Now, this is the antithesis of what we normally do in an academic setting. We spend most of our time asking, what don't we know and how can we fill the gap? And what we don't do is say, have we learned anything in the last 40 years about how kids learn language? And I thought we actually have learned something. And this is what I think we've learned. The first thing I think we've learned is that children learn what they hear most. This is where you go, duh. OK, duh. I once got a call from Red Book. They wanted to know why kids were swearing. I said, well, that's easy. <laughs> okay, I can answer that. <laughs> it became international news. I loved it when I saw it on Pravda. OK, number two. Children learn for things and events that interest them. Here's another one. Come on, guys, join me. Duh. We've learned that, OK? We've studied that. In our lab that Stephen was telling you about, at Lila's lab, she always used to start the day by saying, the way you find out if you have a good question is you see if your grandmother thinks it's obvious. <laughs> if your grandmother said, we already know that, Lila said, go and study it. That's a winner. OK, so that's done number two. Number three, interactive and responsive environments build language. I'm going to spend a lot of time on that one, which will be a bit of a shock for those of you in cognitive psychology that most of the people I know in cognitive language development now think social interaction is way more important than we used to think it was. Number four, children learn best in meaningful contexts. Five, children need to hear diverse examples. So what we don't need to do is simplify, simplify, simplify. We need to actually let them hear the palettes of language so they can see all the colors of it. And that's the way they're going to develop more sophisticated language. And six, vocabulary and grammar actually develop together. So when those of you who do intervention focus only on word learning, you are robbing children of the opportunity to learn words. Doesn't that sound weird? But it is true, so saith the data. OK, so what I want to do now is just take a little bit of time to go through each of these and show you what the scientific evidence is, and then to show you how we can learn that. Number one, amount matters. Amount of speech is important for statistical learning. Amount of speech is important for the speed of processing. Here you see our statistical learner brought to you by Safran, Aslan, and Newport in 1996. Now, honest to God, babies are statistical learners. This is what they did. I am not as good as it at, as those people who actually ran the study, but I'm going to do my best. Here we go, Melanie's going, I can't wait to hear this. Okay. Lina kadu mi na voza ge da li nu me ji da go me na li nu e ga ga zo ba di bi ge ba ga ba la li nu la. All right, what you should have heard is li nu three times. Any of you pick it up? Now, if you didn't, don't worry, babies do. <laughs> and based on just two minutes of that kind of input, babies actually start to make sense of the patterns that they're hearing. Isn't that incredible? And so we say that they are statistical learners. By the way, babies can do it, and chinchillas can't. 
okay? Which is actually cool. It may be something that we really do better than any other species in the world. This is uh, slides that Anne Fernald gave me where um, she used a procedure that she developed off of our intermodal preferential looking paradigm that she calls the looking while listening paradigm. It basically goes like this. On the one side, you have a dog. On the other side, you have a baby. In your very best infant-directed speech, you go, where's the baby? Can you find the baby? Where's that baby? And amazingly, but it's ecologically valid. What do babies do? They look at the baby picture and not at the doggy picture. So that's great that they can succeed in that way. And of course, what you can do is you can measure how long does it take for the baby or child to look in the direction of the baby. And you can see if they make a mistake and look at the dog instead of looking at the baby. So you get what we call reaction time, and you also get an error analysis. <coughs> Excuse me. It turns out that 18-month-olds take longer to get to the right picture, and they're more likely to be wrong than 21-month-olds. All right? So these are some of the ways in which we do multiple guess procedures or tests with little babies. Now, what she did was really, really clever. She went to a group of families at 18 months, and she looked at some who were more talkative to the kids, and some families who were less talkative to the kids. Then she went at 24 months to look to see what happened with those kids. And here is what she found. In the red, you can see the kids who heard more language at 18 months, what they looked like at 24 months. And what you see is the red's higher than the blue. All right? So that's the first thing to notice is that they're more likely to get it correct. The second thing to notice is that they get there quicker. The slope is higher on the red than it is on the blue, which means they do it faster. So the amount of information makes a difference. And when Anne talks about this, she talks about this as speed of processing. And you know that you would be unhappy with me if I continued at this speed, okay? <laughs> you also know if you've ever been around a second language. You also, any of you like, you know a language but you're not fluent in it? So I do that in France, you know, and, and I hear a word that I know, and I'm so excited that I found a word that I know, right, that I stay on it. Of course, the sentence has gone by. That's the problem if you don't have good speed of processing. And so it can really, really hurt you in learning how to process language and in everything that comes with that. So perhaps the amount of input from a particular speaker, or groups of speaker, will turn out to be really critical for the prediction of a word's meaning in a sample distribution as well. And that's some of Anne Christophe's work out of the University of Paris. All right, so amount matters. What about children learn words for the things and events that interest them rather than the things that don't? Lois Bloom used to call this the principle of reference. In work that we've done, we found that kids are more likely, especially 10 and 12 month olds, this is Shannon Pruden's work, um, they're more likely to attach a word to an interesting object than to a boring object. And of course, what we do is we go to your local kitchen store and we find interesting stuff and boring stuff. This is how psychologists spend their time when we're doing research that you wouldn't know the name for, okay? And then we label them with weird names like Blicket. And we say to the baby, oh, can you find the Blicket? Where's the Blicket? Oh, if it's interesting, believe me, the babies learn it. But if it's this dead, boring cap opener, they don't want to learn a word for that. And in fact, you have to worry about that. So what does that mean? It means we should look into where the baby's looking and comment on that because the baby's interested in it. 
and we're going to get more leverage in their vocabulary if we do that than if we try to redirect their attention. So you say, oh man, parents never do that, do they? Go to your local museum and just watch. Watch a parent with a two-year-old, okay? Kids like, oh, you know, talking about whatever it is they see, they're so exciting, and the parent wants to move on because he has paid for that kid to go to that museum, and we are going to see more of that museum, okay? So there's some beautiful work by uh, McGillian that comes out of the University of Sheffield, and she did the simplest intervention I have ever seen. Really, it goes like this. Look at what your baby's looking at and comment on it. <laughs> no kidding. Look at what your baby's looking at and comment on it. Her results are simply stunning because she tried this very difficult intervention and it worked. All right, I want to spend more time on interactive and responsive environments build language learning. That starts with talking with, not talking at. That's a really important point. We spend a lot of time talking at rather than talking with children. We don't believe that we can have conversations with little people. And if we only knew that little people from a very young age could have conversations with us, it would very much change the attitudes we have. Expanding on what a child says and does, noticing what they find interesting, using a label that goes with what they're looking at, and of course, asking questions rather than demands. So I have to show you this because the other thing you must do other than show a brain is show your grandchildren, okay? So here is baby Ellie when Ellie was 10 weeks old. And uh, since we don't have sound, I'm gonna have to move the mic so that you can hear this. But what I want you to notice, let me repeat, baby Ellie is 10 weeks old. Let me also repeat that this is every baby at 10 weeks old. This is not just baby Ellie at 10 weeks old. What I want you to notice is the conversation. The conversation, here we go. Okay, it's actually a really cool example. And it's a cool example for a number of reasons. One, my daughter-in-law, who is absolutely wonderful, is a master's of education from Brandeis University. She was shocked. She was shocked, okay? She said to me, oh, wait a minute. Did you and Roberta just show me that you can have a conversation with a 10-week-old? I said, yep. She said, but I didn't know that was possible. If my daughter-in-law didn't know this was possible, the chances that the mothers that many of us deal with and study know this is possible are less than zero. <laughs> if they only knew that babies could have this kind of a conversation, and in fact, what we've been doing, I'm happy to share this with you. And if anybody wants to use it, go ahead and use it. Show them. Babies can have conversations. Of course, Hart and Risley, as evidence one, already kind of knew that. Because they showed us that one of the things that was missing in that group they called the welfare group was that they weren't having as many conversations and questions. They were hearing more directives. And in fact, in the professional group, they heard many less directives. And of course, many of those are barking at the kids, and many of those are discouragements for conversations rather than encouragements for conversations. A second was a study that I actually did with Margaret. This was one of our really super exciting, uh, at least for me, it was a super exciting experiment. We used 60 low-income children from the NICHD study of early childcare. 
but we chose those kids so that 20 of them were going to have high language scores at age three, 20 of them were going to have middling level scores, and 20 were going to have struggling language scores. And as they say, that was at three years of age. This is what you can do, by the way, with the secondary data analysis, it's so cool. So we could, because we had this data, look backwards in time. And we could go to what happened when these same children were two years of age. What did the mother-child interaction look like? What was the quality of that interaction? Well, Lauren Adamson had a way to study quality that we found most interesting. These are really clunky terms, so I promise I will explain them, but bear with me for a second. One, symbol-infused joint engagement. Did the kids use gesture and words? Okay, two, fluid and connected exchanges. In verbal and nonverbal communication, was there a back and forth? Could you follow that back and forth in the same way that, that Ellie and her mom just had that back and forth? And three, were there any playful routines and rituals? For quantity, we simply measured the number of words per minute that the young child heard. And we wanted to know, would these features be able to predict the amount of variance, the amount of shift, the range of scores that we saw at three years of age. Could you predict the language of a three-year-old by looking at the quality of the interactions and the quantity of the interactions when that child was two? Here are our findings. You ready, guys? Poor quality, I give you Unique quality at 16%. I know 16% more about the three-year-old by knowing what happened in the interaction when they were two with their moms. And I get to add another 10% when I look at the overlap in quality and quantity. That means I now know 26% more about the three-year-old by knowing about the interactions at age two. So you say, oh my gosh, you must be adding so much more by then adding the quantity because we all know quantity is what is important. And there's the answer. An extra 1%. Now, there are a couple things to mention about this study. The first is that quality seems to be a little bit more important than quantity. The secondly is, let's stop blaming things on the low-income, under-resourced families. Just like in the middle-income families. Some are doing the kind of interactions that help their kids grow, and some aren't. This is not a class issue. It's not an economic issue. It's a what do you know to do with your kid developmental issue. Next, fluid conversations are what makes the difference. And so after much trial and tribulation, we decided to call these conversational duets. Now you've all heard the term serve and return that Jack Shonkoff came up with, and it's a good term if you play tennis, it's great. Um, but it's not just serve and return, guys. It's serve and return and return and return and return, okay? If you don't get a whole volley going, forget it. It isn't gonna matter because you're not gonna get the amount and the quality of the interaction. That bears repeating. A conversational duet, you cannot sing it alone. You need to sing it with both of you, all right? So we have to be striving to get conversational duets. Finally, I'd like to suggest that we stop talking about filling the gap and we start talking about building the foundation. Evidence three. Peg Birch and all and I decided to just go over that NICHD data for another reason and look at maternal sensitivity and to see if maternal sensitivity and caregiver sensitivity had any relationship to the kinds of language reading outcomes we were gonna see so many years later. All I'm gonna tell you here is that the less sensitive moms over time are on the bottom and the more sensitive moms over time are on the top, top graph, 
And that's true for the caregivers as well. So we started to think, wow, this sensitivity, this contingency, this <coughs> seems to be what's really important. It's that back and forth that's really making the difference. So if that's true, we reason in our lab with Sarah Roseberry, who did her dissertation on this. Wow, this is so exciting. It could be that we could then compare television, where there is no such interaction, with live interaction, where there is that interaction, with FaceTime. Aren't you dying to know what happened, grandmothers, grandmothers out there? Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, if it turns out, that FaceTime looks more like live because it preserves the back and forth fluid conversation, then you'd have more faith that it's really the back and forth fluid conversation that's making the difference. If, however, the 2D is what's preventing you from really having that conversation, voila, you know that then FaceTime ain't good for kids. And maybe it's not about the contingent fluid conversations. There are the results. Turns out that the live interaction was indistinguishable from the FaceTime interaction. Isn't that interesting? And the worst in the scene was the video. So the watching TV didn't quite do it, even though, by the way, it was the same content. We controlled it. It was the same content. OK, huh. OK, wait a minute. As a scientist, I'm intrigued. If it's really about this back and forth, fluid and connected conversation, if it's really about contingency, my god, that's exciting. So it should be that we have the greatest natural experiment that ever happened going on right before our eyes. Cell phones, right? You know that when you get a text, what you do is you look at your phone. You break the conversation, thinking that no one would ever notice that you are looking at your cell phone at the other end of the table. Actually, I have a son who's married to his cell phone. He really is. I've never kind of seen anything quite like it. And, um, and so one day I was at dinner with him, and I keep seeing him, you know, like, and he's looking like, you know, thinking I'm not noticing. Any of you ever experienced that? Right. I'm clearly noticing it, and I think it's rude. All right, so there you go. So I texted him, hi, mom here, other side of table. <laughs> Want to join the conversation? Put the phone down. Anyway, all right, so this is a study where <laughs> we actually studied cell phone interruption. We taught the mom, well, the mom was to teach the kid two separate words. In one word, we were going to interrupt it with a cell phone call. And in the other condition, the cell phone call was going to come at the end. And then we counterbalanced. Sometimes we you know, interrupted the first word. Sometimes we interrupted the second word. And this work was done by Jessa Reed, who did this as part of her dissertation. Are you ready, guys, to see what it looks like when it's interrupted? I couldn't have found a better example of this. And here we go. Hey, I'm going to show you something. Okay, need we say more? I mean, like the kid tried, right? The kid tried to re-engage mom, but like, and this was a great mom, but it was kind of, you know, mom was gone. She was on her cell phone. She, in our words, broke the contingency. And when you break the contingency, do you learn the word? Here are the results. You can see in the uninterrupted condition, that blue goes above chance, and you can see that the green does not, which is the interrupted word condition. I'm telling you, we are now thinking we are on to something. This fluid and connected thing, this could turn out to be really, really important. And in fact, there's new data suggesting it's really, really important. I mean, in one, Perry looked at it and said, huh, this is cool. 
the kids who have more of this fluid and connected kind of interaction, even in a classroom, they learn better. The kids who have more of it, they learn better all the way up to age 10. Oh my God, this is turning out to be really important. Oh, sorry, second brain picture right here by Rachel Romero. The new data suggests that the, these conversations, this contingency is actually critical for brain growth. This is with older kids, four to six year olds, and she is starting to find that you get more connectivity and actually a better developed Broca's area when you have contingent conversations than when you don't. You should be saying, wow, now, like we've kind of nailed it. And Kim Noble just came out with a new paper. She says, early conversations at home for five to seven-year-olds partially explain the disparities in language supporting brain structure and, in turn, reading skills. In this paper, by Mertz as the first author, she makes the argument that the entire reading gap can be explained through the language gap. Wow, the entire reading gap can be explained through the language gap. All right, children learn best in meaningful, uh, in meaningful context. They learn richer vocabulary when they're into something that they like. We've studied this using blocks. Turns out kids like blocks. The reason I studied blocks, believe it or not, is May Mayor Bloomberg wanted to take blocks out of all the New York City schools. They called me like an emergency. You know, who gets emergencies if you're in my field? You're a language researcher. This is an emergency. Someone's going to die. OK, uh, so we studied this to put blocks back in the classroom. What are they learning? They're learning things like around, on, under, on top of, next to. Why does that matter? Because it turns out that that predicts, and by the way, predicts a lot. Spatial terms predict to math skills. Children need diverse examples of words and language structures. The amount and diversity of the verbal stimulation that they get actually makes a difference and it fosters rich language outcomes. This is some of the stuff, Stephen, that I think you were on that Susan Golden Meadow has done in her lab <clears throat> with Levine. And children's vocabulary performance in kindergarten and later in second grade related to the occurrences of their more sophisticated language um, at age five and beyond. And in fact, this is the kind of stuff that Catherine Snow also talks about, which is if you have more academic language, is the term that she uses, then the kids will do better in school. Finally, vocabulary and grammar. They are reciprocal processes. They develop together. And therefore, you can't pull vocabulary out and expect that that is going to do the trick. People have actually looked at this, and it's really cool, with bilingual families. And they find out that the vocabulary and the grammar track together in the Spanish and separately in the English. Isn't that interesting? So they really pattern together through time. Six principles, one page. Thousands of papers. Works exactly the same if you're bilingual or if you're monolingual. Works exactly the same if you're trilingual. Doesn't really matter. This is the way in which you learn language. So what can we say about this for implication and outreach? How can you use this? How do you move, as this center does, from a foundation of basic research to really making it matter with real kids on the ground. So my story now turns to a beautiful publication that came out in 2009 from the Foundation for Child Development, and it was called Three Mothers and an Eggplant. So there you are, mom one, and mom one comes into the supermarket, and the kid is very excited and looks over and goes, what's that? And the mom, knowing that her kid would hate eggplants, says, you won't like it, and moves along. Then there's mom too. Mom too at least labels the weird purple thing. She says, yeah, isn't that cool? It's an eggplant. We don't eat it, and moves on. And then there's you. <gasps> That's an eggplant, honey. Isn't it interesting? <gasps> you know. We could make eggplant parmesan for dinner. 
there. Would you like to weigh the eggplant? Okay, we go a little bit overboard, but that's kind of the way in which we respond when we're in that supermarket. Now, it turns out that mom one doesn't really use the six principles. You aren't gonna hear the word eggplant if nobody uses the word eggplant. It's something that interested the kid, but gosh, mom didn't care. She just moved on. But mom three took advantage of the learning moment in the natural environment and helped build language by building those natural everyday moments in the world. Our challenge as people who work with young children, especially from underserved environments, is to help mom one become mom three. Well, at least mom two, okay? Maybe not as effusive as mom three. And we can change those trajectories because every one of them is malleable. And I want to show you how we're going about changing it with three examples, one at the family level, one at the classroom level, and one at the community level. I'll warn you now, my community level example is totally off the charts. So get ready, because here we go. Kathy went crazy, but here we go. The first thing I want to tell you about is the duet project that um, Margaret is also a part of with Lauren Adamson, Roberta Golinkoff, Roger Bakeman. It's a community-based participatory research where we really took seriously the conversational duet, hence duet, early engagement for future success. And these are some of the students and postdocs, who, many of whom have now moved on to faculty positions, I'm happy to say. Um, so all of you who are postdocs out there, or graduate students, yes, you will get employed. Okay, and, uh, and you can actually see examples, and when I provide you with the slides, you can go to some of the examples that we did for the duet. Um, the mission was to strengthen the Developing Communication Foundation to enhance and predict language learning and school readiness outcomes. What we were after as goals was to foster awareness and knowledge. My daughter-in-law didn't know about Ellie. You can bet that most of the people out there don't know about Ellie. Well, they don't have to know about Ellie, but they don't know about the conversational duet. That empowers caregivers to know that there's something they can do, goal number two. Goal number three, we wanted to increase the quality and the quantity of the language that the kids were hearing. And goal number four is we wanted to improve outcomes, language outcomes, and hence school readiness. This is kind of like what our um, wonderful animated videos looked like. Of course, they were animated, so if we press the link, you will find them move, because they really do move. These were all drawn, I have to tell you, by Rebecca Alper, isn't that amazing? In our lab to do this study. Where are you going, Ashley? You're right, Ashley, these are all oatmeal. All right, so anyway, it was kind of like that. All of us took a different part in the video. I was happy to be the grandma. But most impressively, what you see in the bottom, and in, I guess in three of these slides, you see this here? This is the older brother, okay? Now, that older brother is the narrator. And that older brother comes in and says things like, wow, mom, that was great the way you asked that question to Ashley. All right, by doing that, we aren't teachy-preachy. We don't have one mom telling another mom what to do. And it has been our experience, all of us on this project, that moms don't want to be told what to do anymore. But this way, they're kind of not. Now we are in a, we're in a project right now where we are trying to see if we can do this light touch. Because these are videos, maybe people can just watch them at home. If anyone in Dallas wants to do more of this, we would be so honored. We are now translating a lot of these tapes to Spanish and moving on with another grant. What do we find? In study one, a very low, and I want to emphasize that, income sample. 27 of 41 were earning less than $25,000 annually. 
with very low numbers because everybody dropped out and most of our Lenas were frankly missing at the end of the study. Um, 15 control and nine intervention. Now, that shouldn't have worked. I wanna be clear about this. When we all talked about it after we heard what happened to the sample size that was supposed to be 60, we talked amongst ourselves, remember Margaret? And we said, oh well, it's a pilot project. Nothing will come out of it because we don't have enough kids for anything to come out of it. But even with that small number, we got a 5.8 increase in a standardized language measure. That's insane. People who saw these tapes started to talk more and the kids started to get better language skills. And that was with only seven weeks of training. And they had more language using this Lena device that actually picks up how much language the kids are using. That's kind of incredible. And the same thing happened when we looked at Head Start teachers. So I just suggest to you again, if any of you would like to use these tapes, they're available to you. Just let me know, let Margaret know. Margaret has the tapes. There you go. We used a lot of the same principles, these six principles, to build the California preschool curriculum framework, and that's actually going on right now in the state of California. We're also studying it through an IES grant, which is a Department of Education grant, where we had kids be in reading group, and then we used these principles to help the kids learn vocabulary, and we then let them go into three different conditions, a free play condition, a directed play condition, a guided play condition, where we either told them what to do, they could do anything that they wanted, but they had all these figurines right in front of them, and they got to play with them. Could reading plus play make a difference for young kids' vocabulary? And in guided play, we use the six principles and those questions to keep the conversation going. And what happened? is that the kids tended to learn more in the more directed, guided uh, kind of play environments. By the way, the one that didn't work was free play. The one that didn't work was free play. We recently did another study that we are just completing, 138 Head Start children. They were 52 months. It was in Nashville, Tennessee, and in Philadelphia. Here what you see in the yellow are the 20 words that we taught, we each heard four times in either a read-only condition, a play and read condition, those are the words that were taught in both, and then some in a play-only condition. Um, if any of you have questions on this study, I'm happy to tell you longer, but the real point I wanna make here is that the results turned out to be quite stunning. Again, I'm not gonna go into it in detail. I'm just gonna tell you that they learned as much in the play condition as they did in the reading condition. Isn't that amazing? And there's some work coming out right now to suggest that shared reading alone is not the be-all and end-all of vocabulary learning for young kids. It is interesting that play environments, here play environments, which we expanded, we had small group games, large group games, we had music, and we had digital games actually work for young kids, and the kids actually learn the words. They're interesting, it's meaningful, it creates dialogue. We are also creating more opportunities for high quality talk in community settings, and this is where I go off the deep end, but bear with me, bear with me. Number one example, the supermarket study. <clears throat> well, I kind of reasoned that maybe we could take places where people naturally go, and we could change those places into rich language environments. Inspired by three moms in an eggplant, we put up signs in the supermarket. The study cost us all of $60. And they were crazy things like, I am a cow, I do milk. What else could come from milk? Now, we didn't know if this would work or not. And in fact, I will admit to all of you that my first guess was not to go in the dairy section, it was to go to eggplants, where it turns out in underserved neighborhoods no parents go down the produce aisle. <laughs> we learned that after three weeks with all of my students crying. Okay, but we went to the dairy and the frozen veggies and we wondered if a signs up condition would be different than a signs down condition. Answer, a 33% increase in mother-child interactions with the signs up over the signs down. 
and that's only in underserved communities, not, I should add, in middle income environments where we're already no, mommy number three. Isn't that interesting? So that's now been replicated by Melissa Libertis' lab using STEM information, by Susan Hespos trying it in a pantry situation, and it works exactly the same way. And Susan Newman has now decided to try it in laundromats, which we're making into literacy environments. All this inspired by going into the grocery store. Urban Thinkscape. Whoa, I do not know what happened here. Sorry, guys. We'll try to get us back. Aha, uh -huh. if we can find it. Hmm. Oh my, one second please, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> All right, we're back. And we call it Urban Thinkscape. Another place that families wait is at bus stops. What could we do with bus stops? This started with a question to an architect friend of mine, Itai Palti, who is pictured here, and with Brenna Hossinger Das, who was a postdoc in my lab now at Pace University. Four activities in the bus stop. Could we change a bench from just being a bench? Could we put puzzles at benches so that just like with the blocks, we got them using spatial language? Could we have enough puzzles so that there were two puzzles per each wall and three walls so that it was iterative and each time people came back to the bus stop? They were doing something different. Could we reinvent hopscotch using the happy sad task to be an executive function hopscotch? We did. Could we create hidden figures like you used to see when you went to the dentist's office, right? Okay. Could you do that out there in the world with shadows and light? Answer was you could. And what happened when we looked at 280 parent-child interactions, we got an increase of 36% in the kinds of language, targeted language, and in the amount of language. By the way, phones went down. Isn't that amazing? So we can make a difference by going into our communities. This is Andres Bustamante, and Andres was a postdoc in my lab. He's now at the University of California, Irvine, and Andres and I invented Parkopolis, the life-size board game to stimulate STEM learning in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Well, when you play this game, you get to not only do hopscotch, but you get to use a new kind of dice we invented. And the dice now have one to six and fractions. And it turns out that now when you go, you can go six and a half spaces. And you might have to add that to two and a half. And by God, the kids loved it. And they learned about fractions. And then they picked cards when they landed on certain spaces. Could they learn more math that way? Could they learn more science that way? We looked at 111 kids. <clears throat> and I should tell you that all of these games are actually developed with the community. And so it's what they want to do and looks like what they want it to look like. And so it is very much a partnership. And when we looked, we found that adults and children were using more number language. They were using more spatial language, all stuff that predicts later school readiness. So that's a paper that's just about to go out. This project is designed for use in our science to create more conversations. And we're trying to do that now throughout the city of Philadelphia with a whole number of these installations that we are dreaming up with community members helping us. Uh, I was just in Akron last week where they decided to try it. What time? Time, ah, okay. Um, I'm almost done, so we're good. Uh, so where, where they decided to try it, they're going to make it a playful learning city in Akron, Santa Ana, California, um, Seattle, Washington. It's starting to spread. So it can come to Dallas, too. Finally, it's important to have accountability. So we did invent a new language acquisition screener that we called the Quills. It is the uh, quick interactive language screener. It is all tablet-based, takes 15 minutes to administer. What we like about it is that unlike many of the other things where you need a specialist to administer it, um, this one can be you know, this can be administered without a specialist. It also includes vocabulary, 
nouns and verbs, process, how kids learn, and grammar, because remember, it's not just words, it's about words and grammar. These are some of the examples, like, where's the hinge? Can you find the hinge? Or in the bottom, I'll just give you one, the FEP is blue, show me the blue FEP. Can you show me another FEP? Notice I told you, stickiness and generalization. Um, this, we now know it works. Beautiful progressions using 673 kids for the monolingual test. There's significant um, differences, whether you're from an under-resourced environment or more resourced environment. Vocabulary, syntax, and processes are all linked across the course of development. And we are developing a Spanish version, which is actually due to come out in two weeks at the ASHA conference, so stay tuned. Bottom line, with all this data, and with all that we know, we can ask as scientists what we know, not only what we don't know. And sometimes we can reduce and distill what we know into usable packages. Here for language, I've done that with six principles. Six principles, one page, a lot of science to back it up. As a starting point, we have to start interventions early and we have to create environments that encourage folks to engage in language-rich conversations. Because increasing language proficiency, I believe, will be the single best way to enhance outcomes for all children over time. And I do wanna, again, emphasize that none of this could be done without my lab and without Roberta Golenkoff. We have been uh, professionally married for 40 years now. <laughs> and uh, of course with the parents. And these are the grandkids who keep me going. And also Roberta and I try really, really hard to uh, tweet. We're just learning. We're not as good as the people who are under 40, but we're trying to get it. And this is our Twitter handle. If you wanna see what's coming out um, in the whole field of developmental psychology, we try to track it and put it up there for everyone. Thank you. So Margaret, you have to, give me, should I take questions or not? Yeah, is that okay? Okay, we have 10 minutes for questions. Anybody have questions? If I confused you all, I apologize. Yeah. I used to be a home visitor. Uh-huh. And what I noticed. First of all, thank you. Well, um, so many of the kids sit in front of a television all day and that's the language that they hear. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering with all your creativity, if there would be some way that you could get to parents um, at the grocery store or out to let them know that um, that's not great for their kids or some things that they could do with their kids while they're all watching you know, No, I mean, it's, it's great. Look, our field has sure tried to do co-viewing. You know, we've tried it, PBS has tried it, um, Sesame tried it. The truth is we all failed. I'm be, you know, just being honest with you. We could not get parents to co-view. And my view is we're not gonna do a really great job of getting them to co-watch on apps either. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a hard sell. Uh, what I think we have to do is provide alternatives. You know, uh, there's, a really, there's a really cute book. It's called, uh, you all know Goodnight Moon, right? So they, they put this thing on, what was it? Goodnight iPad, I think is the name of it. Anyway, <laughs> no, you should take a look at it. But, but there are some stories out there. And the truth is that, you know, if the kids see that there's other stuff to do, they actually will do it. So if we can occupy them in other ways, and our community-based stuff, whether it's in the supermarket or whether it's at the bus stops, um, this is hopefully a way to help parents begin to recognize um, what can be done and how really wonderful and rewarding it is to have conversations with your children. The um, conversational duet project that Margaret is on, uh, we're actually now trying that with light touch, you know, as I said, where people can just watch it. People are getting the message by watching this. So you're right, it would be great if we could get all parents to turn off the television and to put down the iPads. 
Uh, we sure have tried, but we need a new way to communicate it because whatever we're doing isn't working and I think maybe our best way is alternative things to do. But thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, actually, actually, I would imagine some of that's happening in Dallas too. You know, a lot of people don't understand or haven't understood the value of play. And they haven't understood the learning value of play. And so the result is, I mean, you ask people, they'll tell you, it's, it's just play, okay? That's something I get so much. And I say, oh, you mean a liberal arts education for children? <laughs> I now have suggested that all schools do a parents' night where we put up playful things and we ask, you know, what, what's the learning value? What could the learning value possibly be of this shovel and pail? You know, and they'll go, oh, nothing. You know, and they say, wow, that's not what I see. I see math in there, conversations, reading. Whoa, you wouldn't believe what I see in that shovel and pail. Once they see it, I talk about it as changing the lens. If we can change the lens on the way parents see the environment that they're in, it's amazing how much we can get change. And that's what we've been trying to do. And sometimes you can have some real fun on parent night too, by having half the parents in a direct instruction condition <laughs> and half in a playful. Yeah, and you should see what happens. Seriously, I've seen this many, many times. The parents who are stuck over there with the teacher telling them what to do, they're looking over here like, why, why am I not there? How did I end up in this group? Oh, you wanna be in that group? Oh, well, so do your kids. <laughs> So do your kids. So it's our job, you know, it's our job. And there are subtle ways, subtle ways, and non-subtle ways. I'll just give you one other answer to your question, which is uh, I work a lot in children's museums. God, my job is fun. And um, they were worried in Baltimore that they couldn't get the parents to see the value of a diner exhibit, a diner exhibit, even had a cash register, okay? So we asked parents, we did a little interview, we said, oh, like, what's the learning value of this? And then we went to the hieroglyphics, we said, what's the learning of that? Oh, man, we saw the hieroglyphics right away. <laughs> we're learning history. But in the diner, we're learning nothing, okay? So what we decided to do is just put up little signs. I'm telling you, really little signs that had rulers on it, okay? It said, what your child is getting, math, <clears throat> you know, Social study, history, okay. Then we went back to the parents after the little signs were up. They were little icons, okay. And after we had them up, we interviewed the parents again. We said, hey, what's happening in, the, in this exhibit? They said, well, don't you see all the math? I said, no, can you tell us about it? Yeah, there's a cash register. The menu has numbers on it. So sometimes I think what parents need is a nudge rather than a hammer. And in our field, we're more used to giving them sledgehammers the nudges. And so what I'm in the business of doing now is testing out our nudges. Yeah. Thank you, that was a great talk. One of the things you talked about at some point was guided play yeah. in particular. And so yeah. you've talked about the value of play in general, yeah. but there is a distinction between free play, directed play, and or, or guided play. So can you talk a little bit more about that and what sort of guidance we can give Thank people? you for feeding that. You're welcome. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so in the, the world that um, I inhabit now, I have talked about a spectrum of play. And in that spectrum of play, you do have free play, which is, think of that as building a fort from the cushions on the couch, okay? The kid is the one who figures out what to do, and the kid directs what's going on in that environment. All right, we all have it, free play, okay? The second is as you move a little bit up, if you have a learning goal in mind, and it's really important to think about if I have a learning goal in mind. What we are learning in study after study after study, and I just showed you one example today, is that free play doesn't do it. If you have a learning goal in mind, having the kids just go out to the forest and discover reading ain't gonna happen, okay? Just not gonna happen. Okay, so given that that's not gonna happen, could we construct a kind of play, I call it guided play, which uses in fact some of the principles, okay? Where what you do is it's adult, you know, initiated, but child directed. Now what I want you to think of is Montessori, I want you to think of a children's museum, all right? What happens in a good school environment 
in a, in a good childcare environment, is that you have well curated spaces. People thought about what to put in there, blocks, you know, water tables, whatever it is you put in your child care center, okay? Now, the kid can have a lot of freedom within the environment that you've curated. So it's still child-directed, but it's adult-initiated, all right? When it is, when it moves to adult-initiated, adult-directed, that's when you get direct instruction. Direct instruction certainly points you in the right direction, but from what we can tell, it's too handcuffy. And the kids neither get it in a sticky way, nor can they transfer it to a new situation. So we believe, and there are a number of researchers working on this right now, that guided play may be the optimal way to help young children achieve a learning goal. Okay? And that direct instruction and free play um, are not. Does that mean free play is bad? No. It means free play is great for a whole lot of other things. But if you have a learning goal in mind, free play just ain't going to get you there. And so when you see the studies that have come out, the scientific studies that say, well, play doesn't work, right? Play is not working. That's because those are founded on free play rather than guided play environments. So don't believe that data, okay? Every single time, Liz Bonowitz is doing fabulous work on exploration and guided play. Pat Shafto looking at what's going on in classrooms and guided play. There is now com coming a wealth of research. So thanks, Candice, for mentioning that. Because it, it is really important that we have that distinction and I think if we think guided play, in fact, guided play is also, you know, really what you saw in my trying to change the architectural environment. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you for the good talk. Sure. Very informative. Thank you. So I work in the natal intensive care unit. Yeah. I also have my own premature children born at 25 weeks. They're now 19 years old. Yeah. Um, my children suffered um, expressive language delay. Uh -huh. And most of the NICU babies are um, more likely will have a language delay when they reach um, toddler, you know, um, toddlerhood or um, most of them actually um, have like um, diagnosed with expressive language delay by the time they're two years old. Same with my children. I learned uh, in my practice through early childhood intervention that reading um, and play could help my children with the language delay. So I, um, I did that to my children. Now I'm an active and uh, educator in our NICU uh, parents, and um, we developed a shared reading program in our NICU, and we tried to um, uh, uh, encourage other NICUs to do the same. I would l like to ask her opinion about um, your, sh you think that shared reading would increase um, really the vocabulary language development and improve interaction of parents to their children, to give them a chance at least Absolutely. the premature children. Yeah, it's a brilliant idea. Look, anything that encourages conversation is a plus, okay, anything. And when you do shared reading moments with children, which is why bedtime routines are so fabulous, right, is that you go beyond the cover of the book. Right, shared reading doesn't mean you sit there and just read a book. And we have to be more careful as scientists who put this out there. Sometimes we're misinterpreted as if we're supposed to read verbatim these books. And, you know, Kathy Tamas Lamanda, a good friend of mine from New York, also a scientist, she said to me, you will not believe what I saw one day. She went into one of these centers uh, with a Latino, it was a Latino center, and there was this mom sitting in the corner reading the Bible to her child. I said, what are you doing? She said, well, I was told I should read to my kid. Okay, yes, but maybe not the Bible. You know, I mean, that's a great book, but not clear the kid's really gonna understand what you're talking about. Whereas when we read to a two-year-old or a one-year-old, notice what you do, right? You, you take that book and you try to ground it all the time. In fact, there's a word for it in our world which is called dialogic reading. It's about having the conversation around the book, right? Oh, that's curious, George, when was the last time you saw a monkey at the zoo? 
I wonder what Curious George is going to do next. Should we turn the page and find out what trouble he got into now? So all of that is building language conversation. And whatever we can do in NICUs and elsewhere to help build the conversation. But remember, too, that a conversation is not one-sided. It's a back and forth. Oh, Kathy, there's so many things I want to say, and I want to say thank you very much, but I, maybe I'll say two things. <laughs> okay. Go for it. Okay. Um, and it's just one anecdote. It's actually two anecdotes. Mm -hmm. um, in the Center for Children and Families, uh, Wake Conmigo, Playful Learning, Play With Me program, you know, we get re reports from the moms. Uh, they, 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 you know, they're effusive. And one mom, we cried when she told us this, and mm -hmm. we wrote it down, and we've shared it, but she came to the program because she said she just really didn't like being with her child and with her nephew, and so she was going to bring them to the program so that they could have something, you know, because she just wanted to push them aside. So she came to the program because of our wonderful toys and what was going on there. And she said, um, well, this one's, I don't know. You know, this cured the inner child in me. I learned how to play. And I think, you know, some parents have lost, how do you play with a child, okay? And what we need is a good video of you with blocks and your grandchildren, and uh, maybe we can share that and be very interactive with that. The other is just what you, Margaret, I don't know. I just, I, I just want to say one thing to that woman, though. One of the things we've noticed with these architectural designs, it's really interesting, is that even the people who say they don't know how to play, and there's lots of them. When you put, let me just give you one example of what we've done. These are so simple, you can't even imagine it. Is that we put down like a long ruler. So imagine the whole front of this stage had a ruler on it, okay? Do you know what happens? If I were even to put it here, well, you might be embarrassed to do it, but, but if I put a long ruler down and I just put it in a space, do you know what happens? People, yes, everybody jumps including the adults. They all start jumping. And then it becomes a game to see who jumped the farthest. Even the adults. And then they're doing math. So even these people who absolutely told us, oh my god, you know, can't do it. They learn bigger, smaller, farther. <laughs> um, the other one I shouldn't probably end with, but this it stayed with me years ago, from years ago, an observation in a child care center here in Dallas we were assessing the children's quality of experience in the, and this was a longitudinal study. Nonetheless, we went into this room, observed for an hour. All the kids were at one end of the room. The teacher was at the other end of the room, okay, number one. The kids were being very aggressive with one another, and our focal child was under a table as other children were uh, threatening him and he was huddled with a little girl. That's the one bad part. The next was that then the teacher said, okay, it's story time, get in a circle. Mm -hmm. She got the circle of the kids together. She pulled out the Bible story. She read it deadpan, and then she asked each child around the table, who was Elijah? I don't know. Who was Elijah? I don't know. Who was Elijah? I don't know. And it was just devastating to watch our child. We thought, this can't be, this can't be. So we went back a second time and did a second observation. It must have been a bad day. It was the same thing. And, you know, then we tried to, you know, shake up the child care director and get someone to go look at that daycare center that had been in operation. <clears throat> this was probably 20 years ago and it had been in operation for 20 years. Anyway, that's a bad place to end, and I'm sorry about that. So let's have Kathy play with blocks. <laughs> Could you get more positive about the good ones that you see? <laughs> no, no, that was a good one. She, my, our mother learned how to play, and she yeah. loved it. Good, in, good. In our program today. All right. <laughs> I feel better already, don't you? No, but you know, seriously, you, what, what parents don't, don't know, Margaret, that yeah. we can help them see. You know, we did this thing we called the Ultimate Block Party in, in Central Park, New York. We took over um, the band shell that was the beginning of this foyer that we were doing at Playful Learning Landscapes. And um, were you there, Mandy? It was like insane. But anyway, one of the images that stuck with me, Raul, this one's for you. So um, Pat Cool, who 
you know, arguably started, you know, educational neuroscience. And she decided she was going to do bilingual bingo. Now, I got to tell you, when I heard bilingual bingo, given what else was going on, I thought, oh, this is going to be deadly. I can't believe this is what the University of Washington wants to do. But they did. And we're sitting in there, and there's this one mom. She walks in with a Spanish flyer, and she's holding her kid's hand, like, so tight. And she is standing more erect than I've, like, like, you have never seen posture like this, right? And I said, wow, what's up? And she goes, until today, I never knew that having two languages was a good thing. All right, take a five-minute break. <laughs> Go on out there.